Hi, everybody, and welcome to our 2023 prediction show. Uh, I'm joined here with John Gannon and Jennifer Morvitz, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, a couple of topics here. Uh, one is sort of the uh, developments in the regulatory environment, and uh, we'll also talk about the importance of vulnerability management as a part of this, and we'll uh, give you our predictions along those lines there. But John, let's start with you. And uh, let's talk a little bit about what kinds of things are happening in the regulatory environment. What are your observations? Yeah, thanks, Brian, and, and great to be here talking with you and, and Jen. Um, so I think uh, as we've talked about on many occasions and your audience may know, um, for a long time, uh, cyber has been um, mostly a voluntary approach uh, by the government and the US federal government in particular. Um, there's been a great partnership uh, between the private sector and the public sector on things like information sharing and dealing with threats. Um, and there's a long history of that collaboration working well, even if individual companies or entities have regulators that they have to answer to at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think what we can now say is over the past couple of years, for any variety of reasons, we now see increasingly a shift from this partnership model toward a more regulatory approach. Yeah. And I, I put these into a couple of buckets. One would be sort of upfront guidelines that could turn into um, specific requirements that would be part of a security program. Um, secondly, there's incident reportings of different flavors that are coming out from different agencies. And then third, what we're seeing is a lot of scrutiny by different agencies of how companies are implementing those after the fact, in particular, if there's been some type of an incident uh, that they've responded to. Yes. And so uh, we're seeing, and it's actually many agencies that are getting involved in these types of things. It, it, now, would you consider the precedent of this, the, sort of the, uh, the ground setting, I think there was an executive order from the White House that basically overtly stated that they had intended to go toward a regulatory approach to things. Uh, and then that seems to have, uh, have spread out to some others. Is that your observation as well? Yeah, I think there are a few different factors. There's certainly an executive order from a couple of administrations ago where it it lauded this private partner, uh, private public partnership, say that mm -hmm. three times fast. It resulted in the NIST cybersecurity framework, which was a, a great collaboration and really advanced the ball. Um, we are actually expecting uh, a cybersecurity strategy to be issued by the White House um, sometime perhaps uh, by the end of this year, maybe early next year, where there may be sort of an enhanced focus on um, regulatory agencies taking a look at their authorities to see whether they think they have enough authority or whether they need to be more active in that space. So um, I, I think you see that from different parts of the, the White House. I think you mm -hmm. also just see individual agencies, for example, the Federal Trade Commission or the Security and Exchange Commission, really taking a look at what their jurisdiction is when it comes to cybersecurity and sort of testing the bounds and, and finding out what rulemaking and investigations they should be per, uh, pursuing. All right, very good. Sets the groundwork here, and then uh, we'll come back to this in, in a little bit, kind of review what our prediction is and uh, some of the uh, considerations around that. Great. Then let's switch over to you and uh, talk a little bit about uh, vulnerability management. I know you're uh, involved heavily in vulnerability management at and so I know you know what you're talking about. So <laughs> uh, what, what are your observations? What have we been seeing over the last several years? Yeah, well, you, you can see from just if you go look at reference and NIST and, and our national vulnerability database that, you know, we're we're growing and we continue to grow year over year. Um, I think this year we might might top 25,000. Um, when you say you're referring to the uh, the NIST data, that is the, the number of vulnerabilities that NIST is recording, right? Correct. Right, right. If you go look at the NIST, um, mvd.nist.gov in particular. <laughs> you can go and, and see that, you know, there's been growth year over year. And I think that'll continue in large part just because of the new technologies and, and software that continue to evolve. So as we have new software year over year, um, new firmware year over year, it just is, it the, allows the opportunity to, you know, find vulnerabilities and explo exploit those vulnerabilities. So mm -hmm. I think that trend will definitely continue. Yeah, absolutely. And so in terms of the actual exploits of those uh, activities, there perhaps there's some observations we can get from that as well. Yeah, I, I think you can you can 
you know, if you if you look into zero day vulnerabilities, I think 2021 was a banner year. I mean, it was a significant jump from 2020 and even from this year. And, um, you know, so the reasoning for that could be attributed to, again, just software and technology growth. There's been some research that um, I think Google Project Zero has done suggesting that that vendors are just doing a better job with early identification of vulnerabilities and disclosures mm -hmm. of vulnerabilities. So that could be a reason. And there's also been other research that's been done by, I believe, Mandiant and others that have pointed to uh, the growth of, you know, a distributed solutions that go into the cloud environment, as well as just mm -hmm. IoT growth in general. So all of those things just increase the, the landscape of uh, opportunity. Yeah. You know, what I think one of the things is uh, interesting to consider is uh, when a, a zero, we're talking specifically about zero days here. There are other exploits, obviously, that exist, but zero day is a case where the exploit is out there before the vulnerability is generally known by the public or, you know, or officially known. And uh, if you consider the uh, circumstances which a zero day would be, zero day would be actually used by an organization, it suggests that they have the capability to identify vulnerabilities independent of the rest of the world, essentially. Uh, the capability to create the exploits independent of the rest of the world. And then are going to tend to be more selective about the use of a zero-day vulnerability. That is, once they expose it, it's exposed. And so it means that perhaps they're targeting someone or somebody that uh, other well, more well-known exploits just plain aren't available or aren't going to work. So it's kind of a, a path of re last resort. And it's interesting to see that the uh, sort of the diversity of the organizations, as well as when I say organizations, that is the target software uh, has been increasing, as well as the, um, uh, the number of cases that have uh, taken place. And even though there's been a drop in 2022, uh, or at least so far, uh, it appears that perhaps maybe it's not the availability of the technology, but perhaps the need to take advantage of that capability that's influencing how often it gets used. So we saw a big growth in 2021. Uh, you know, we see that the, the, the Russia-Ukraine conflict was brewing around the end of 2021. I don't know that that's a significant portion of it. Perhaps there are other events that were driving it, but... Uh, you know, to your point, I think even the Mandiant report also did sort of cite that a lot of those zero day exploits were attributed to uh, Chinese origin, uh, perhaps just really trying to understand the circumstances around, uh, you know, the pandemic and or other topics. It's uh, it's really difficult to say, but I don't know. Would, would you agree with some of I mean, that's my interpretation. Do you do you agree? Yeah, I, I think I think the the remote work. Uh, was an interesting is an interesting thing to see if you in the growth of zero days between 2020 and 2021 in particular. So you start seeing that rise again. I think it's just opportunity, right? When you know people are scrambling around the pandemic, um, access might not have been as tightened down as one would have liked to see. So you know malicious actors are opportunistic and and taking advantage of uh, things that are going on on broader scale. So I, I agree with that. Um, and I think you'll always see vulnerabilities being exploited by like low hanging fruit. So known vulnerabilities mm -hmm. will continue to be a source of exploitation. But I think uh, more targeted, sophisticated types of things of, of uh, exploits against vulnerabilities um, probably will be associated more with the zero day area, as mm -hmm. you suggest. Yeah. Well, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and cite that mandate report. They did kind of point out that uh, a reasonable proportion of those attacks appear to be financially motivated. Um, it does kind of suggest that, uh, and perhaps naturally so, that perhaps some of the criminal groups have gotten sufficiently sophisticated that they could uh, really take advantage of zero-day exploits and, uh, on an increasing scale. So we'll have to see how that plays out over time. Yeah, um, yep. All right, so very good. So let's talk a little bit about the predictions here, and uh, I'll just kind of quickly summarize. I'll give you a chance to uh, jump back in here, John, but the uh, cybersecurity re regulation is basically increasing from a variety of sources. Uh, obviously, it's going to be important that we pay attention, that is uh, collectively pay attention to those changes 
Uh, none of this is really solid at this point. It's very much in flux. So understanding what those changes are and how it impacts any given organization is going to be important. And then uh, also considering that a lot of these requirements aren't really, uh, you know, they're not quantitative. They're very qualitative in nature, require some judgment. So perhaps uh, making sure that we have a good understanding and documented sort of interpretation of the requirements so that uh, if it does come into question that uh, you have a basically a basis for understanding it. But uh, John, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I agree with both of those, Brian. I mean, on the pay attention exchanges, it's a very fluid landscape, right? So we talked at a very high level about how there is more coming, but some of them are draft regulations. They're coming from multiple agencies and they're on different topics. And so subscribing to a good um, news service or cyber service that will sort of keep track of those may be one way to sort of keep an eye on it. But um, for sure, keeping an eye on what happens over the course of the next year is critical. And then on the second point that you made, this goes back to a discussion you and I have had for many years, which is write it down, right? It is easier to write it down contemporaneously than it is to try to recreate what you're doing when someone is coming and asking about it. And I think that's the sort of environment that we're looking at now that um, even there are some that are qualitative, for example, some of the incident reporting ones um, where some have a 72 hour window versus a four day window or whatever it happens to be. But beyond those, um, there there is not a lot of guidance at the moment. So taking a look at them as they come out, memorializing how you're implementing them or where you're deviating and for what reasons is a good exercise. So that way you have that if you ever need it down the road. Awesome. Very good. And uh, Jen, you certainly cited the uh, increased number of vulnerabilities. We also see that there certainly are at the very least surges in zero days. Uh, so really it seems increased importance to understanding the context of vulnerabilities that is, you know, we can patch till we're blue in the face, but uh, really understanding the context of those uh, and perhaps protecting despite the vulnerabilities is an important part of this. So uh, layered security is a uh, important facet of it. And, uh, you know, just as an example, the combination of access management and WAF and input validation on the applications themselves and, you know, naturally the patching of the software that we know to have vulnerabilities or perhaps good uh, security approaches to this. Uh, what are your thoughts? Right, I, I agree with, with all of the, the points about the layered security. I think it's important to have a really good understanding of, of your inventory. Um, I, I can't say that enough. Uh, that's kind of the basis. And then uh, make sure you're testing at a regular cadence and then you know, having the ability to do risk prioritization is key. So understand kind of where your critical systems are and be able to respond to those first, whether it be um, with remediation, um, as you pointed out, with layered security or patching itself. I think those, those are key items. And something that's also really important to do is be able to have like an event management, whether it's an incident response process or a vulnerability event management process that you can that you already have, you have formalized, you're working closely with your business unit partners and that you tabletop throughout the year. So that if you do have to react, you can react quickly and it's something that's known to, to the business and, and uh, it's just make things more streamlined. All right, very good, thank you. So perhaps a little bit of a deviation from my looking at the threats perspective here. Uh, we're really looking at how is the cybersecurity landscape changing and how we need to adapt to it and as we go into 2023. But I think really important things. I thank you for joining us today and um, have a good afternoon. Thanks. Thank you.